Welcome to Four Quarter Lives. I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and I'm exploring how longer lives impact everything, from careers and relationships to the very shape of our lives. Truth is, you're likely to live a lot longer than you think. I talk with a wide range of experts and academics, as well as individuals designing and redesigning their own third quarters, the years from 50 to 75. Instead of recreation, they're thinking recreation. What can we learn from their pioneering roadmaps through life? Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot is a particular inspiration of mine, a Harvard professor of education with a teaching and writing career spanning five decades. I discovered her by reading her wonderful book and discovered it was awfully close to the one I was wanting to write. It's called The Third Chapter, Risk, Passion, and Adventure in the 25 Years After 50. It was a complete echo of what I was thinking, exploring, and discovering. Synchronistically, she was also the professor who interviewed me for acceptance to the Harvard Leadership Initiative that I joined. You won't be surprised to hear we got along. More significantly, she's written a dozen books, been a recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Prize, among a bevy of other awards. When she retires, she will be the first African-American woman in Harvard's history to have an endowed professorship in her honor. In this podcast, she gives us a glimpse into her extensive writing and thinking about life's third and fourth quarters. So it's a very particular joy to welcome Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot to Four Quarter Lives. You've been far more seminal in my life than you have any idea of, I think. <laughs> One, when I first read your book, the third chapter, uh, a couple of years ago, it was such a meeting of minds with somebody I'd never met. And then, yes. of course, because you were the person who interviewed me to get into Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative. So... A joy to have you. Welcome. Thank you. So good to be here. Now, you have written kind of the seminal book on the changes that come upon us rather unexpectedly for many of us in midlife, and it's called The Third Chapter. And you refer to this as the quarter century after 50, so 50 to 75. When, how did this come to you? Was this your own aging? What age and stage did you get interested? And what did you learn as you wrote all of this down and interviewed all those people? And did it help in your own management of your yeah. third chapter? Well, I think at a certain point in my life, which was probably in my early third chapter, I would be sitting at a dinner table at a dinner party or staying at a cocktail party or at a professional meeting, and people would kind of lean into me and say, talk to me about something important, vital, interesting, exciting happening in their lives that sort of surprised them and that they were a little bit embarrassed about, you know, because they thought, I'm in my third chapter, I'm over 50, I shouldn't be feeling these kind of stirrings in me, <laughs> and yet I do. And they're sort of more exciting than the work that I'm doing now. They are taking me a little bit apart from other relationships as I go into them. So they might talk about training for a half marathon when they've never run in their lives or taking voice lessons that they wanted to take when they were three or four or five. I would listen to this. I was very intrigued both by their feeling of shyness and reticence and embarrassment about telling me about this, but also that it seemed really authentic, that somehow this was not cocktail chatter. Yeah, this was really real, deep. It's coming real from deep, deep with talk, it, yeah. real deep talk. I began to think about this. And also, I knew the literature, which really hadn't given us much direction about what was happening to people after their mid-years, right? We knew a lot about childhood, all the stages of adolescence. We know about early adulthood. And then it sort of drifted. The literature just sort of drifted away. And we were supposed to be grown-ups after that time. Settled. Know who we are and what we want. Right. And then my mother, who is a psychiatrist, who was, she died at the age of 105 about oh, wow. two geez. years ago, uh, a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, epidemiologist, pediatrician, who had an incredible life in family, in, in romance, in career. And I wrote a book about her called Bomb and Gilead. When she was 70 and I was 40, I thought she was old at 70, right? And at some point, 
she said later on after the book was well finished, she said to her three children, you need to come and visit me and get to know me. How interesting. Get to know me again. And what she was meaning was your view of me isn't current and I am growing here. And my father had died. One of the things that she was trying to learn how to do was to make friends beyond the relationship with my father. She had loads of acquaintances and friends, but not the kind of friends that she knew that her children had that were really deep and reciprocal and trusting and honest and vulnerable. So we gathered there in what we called the Homestead Summit. And we, my siblings and I, talked to her over three days. Wow. And then as she grew older and older, we... How old was she during the summit? She was just 70. Yep. Okay. Right. But then as she got older, once a year, we would meet with her. And by the end, it was really, these conferences were not only called the Homestead Summit, she named them Transition to Eternal Life. So I just knew that there was so much in these years that was very, very interesting, transformative, and that I really wanted to capture that experience for myself. And I had begun my career working with babies from zero to two in a Piagetian study at Albert Einstein Institute. And since then have been just interested in the whole kind of arc of life and trajectory of life. And I knew that that arc of life had changed, that sociologically, developmentally, this arc of life now has changed. And so something different is happening here than it did a hundred years ago, that's for sure. And I wanted to study those phenomena. What really struck me about the book, the third chapter, was how clearly you articulated something I had experienced in all these interviews I did of people this age, of the shock of how, as you say, a little embarrassed or really profoundly shocked at how lost and confused and Mm -hmm. questioning they can be at an age and stage where they think they should be grown up. So what is this new thing? How does longevity impact this new sort of was this always the case or is this something I probably, that longevity is making? I think longevity has, and sort of shifting cultural norms and themes about this. I mean, we're getting these mixed messages from society, right? What are they? What are we hearing? What are yeah, well, we, we're hearing settle down, stay on the edges, uh, that kind of thing. On the other hand, there is Biden and he's 79 years old and Trump however old he and is. And the whole crew yeah, of them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so there are those things. There's Helen Mirren yep. looking sexy and strong and alluring. So there are those ideas that, you know, you're still vital, you're still alive, you still are capable of leadership and those kind of things. On the other hand, the other mode that we get going into the supermarket or going to see your doctor in the hospital is this kind of condescending, you are older, sweetie pie, and can I be of help? And there's not really any idea of you as imaginative or vital or- Flourishing uh, or developing. Yes, or thriving. It's a very, very confusing time for us. And I think the latter cultural press of seeing us as done, as over, is the much more- kind of powerful piece. And you're very unusual in having a mother who sounds like an actual role model in this space. I think most people are quite disconnected from the generation above them. And many of us don't have role models even around that we would find aspirational. Yeah. I should have said that my mother in this has been a role model. I mean, she was beautiful. She told her girls and her son, we were beautiful and that we were beautiful all through our lives. In other words, we didn't lose our beauty. We didn't lose our vitality. We didn't lose our sexiness, our sensuousness, our intelligence. Just because we were getting older, we saw it in her, right? There are some big economic interests in making us feel like we're not so attractive anymore. Exactly, exactly. So I think that you were asking, what do you think the shock was about? I think the shock was that they had probably imagined a kind of decline and stability and certainty. And suddenly they were feeling awkward and vulnerable and foolish. 
And they were surprised by, just very, very surprised by that. And as you said, confused by the whole scene. The other thing that I should say is that the kind of work I do which I call portraiture, which is an effort at, it's a kind of qualitative research that tries to go very deep with people. Yep. And I think that some of the reasons that we have not known a lot about adult development in men and women, by the way, yep. is a sort of a methodological artifact that we haven't asked and we haven't listened. And that if you are someone who is sort of trained in this and believes in this kind of inquiry, research inquiry, and you're willing to listen and probe, and you develop a sense of trust with the people you're talking to. These are stories that want to be told, <laughs> even when people don't know it. Yeah. And it's a great relief to discover that there is someone who will listen and that it is important to someone else. You know, it's, it's a very poignant and lovely thing that goes on here. And I imagine the telling is actually part of the journey and the successful management. So what does make, after all the interviews and stories you've heard, what does make for a successful or at least a more serene midlife transition? Because I find people are quite uncomfortable in this moment. Mm -hmm. I often find there's a bit of shame around all the feelings yeah. and what can they do differently? What can we all prepare for differently? And I'm just wondering what was the impact of this book and these stories as you went around the world sharing them, well, people's own transitions. I think that to that last point, I think that you and I have both had this experience of people feeling very, very relieved that there are other people going through these struggles as well. That this is not them. They're not individually hurt or harmed or crazy. <laughs> or childish, or whatever it is, but rather this is a developmental phenomenon. It's hard to get through. I did not interview anyone who did it with serenity. I certainly have not done my work on this with serenity. It's just, and it's interesting because it doesn't help to be a good student in school. All the, all the ordinary things doesn't help to be super intelligent. It doesn't help to be a type A personality. As a matter of fact, it might hinder that. Type A's bump that, into this worse exactly. than anybody because it's the most unexpected thing they've Exactly. And they're not used to not being in control or not being, you know, kind of moving forward smoothly. I think that one of the things, the response to my work has been, thank you. I love to speak to people about it, and I love, particularly when I was going around the world talking about this book, was because people could so easily get into the stories, tap into the stories, feel identified, and feel implicated that this was the work now that they had to do, and that it was all right that it was hard, that of course it was hard, and that it was life transformative, and sometimes those transformations don't turn out all that well or are not that easy to land. I think later on we were going to talk about, well, what happens with couples? What happens when one person goes on that journey and the other person doesn't? And I remember one person saying about her husband when she wanted to do something different and big. Yeah. She kept on saying to me, he's sabotaging me. She wanted to leave work and come home and work from home and start a new project. And he said, I mean, he did everything in his power to sabotage her in that. And then on the other hand, other people told me stories about being able to do what they needed to do in their third chapters because of this sort of stalwart anchor of the spouse who says, go for it, baby, go for it. In your view, this I'm fascinated by the whole dual career challenges of the third chapter. And does it have to do in the respective careers? There's a trajectory. There are two trajectories that either sometimes support each other or conflict. And I think it has a lot to do with how satisfied people are with what they've done up till now. Right. They're able to then let their partners have a turn or shine and there's a huge gender slant to all this. We're not yes. saying it, but it's underlying mm -hmm. our words. Underlying, right. And it's interesting, when I was reading over your suggested questions, I was thinking 
<laughs> in the shower this morning, you know, there are not these clear differences in gender, but that one of the things that I have felt is that women want to do something bigger and men want to do something smaller. Yeah, because they've done something in the first half of their lives. They did the reverse of what they were The reverse. So this story of this financial investment person made lots of money was a big honcho, big, big guy who was telling the story of all of this relationship drama that had happened between he and his wife, who had had a career, but much less kind of public and lucrative career. And he said, it is as if... I'm approaching shore, right? In my canoe, I'm paddling in and I look over there and there (laughs) is Jessica and she is in her rowboat or kayak paddling out to sea, paddling out to sea. He said, I'm so desperate to come home. I want to come home. I want to do those things. He said, I will even empty the dishwasher. (laughs) I mean, that was the even that, even, even that, that, even oh my that, God. I there's no that. limit. Exactly. And so I think that sometimes it is very, very related to gender, depending upon what the man and the woman have done before in their lives. What's interesting is it can be totally complimentary. The man rowing home, if he's happy to then, yeah. I don't know, carry her luggage or accompany yeah. her on a plane, or whether it becomes really conflictual that basically he wants her to be his golfing partner and was counting on that and is then feeling abandoned to right. his fate all alone at home while she's yes. off doing the things yes. that she's never done before. And any advice? So this whole tumult that we're talking about, is it helped by the normalization of these curves, books like yours should forewarn us, prepare us, give us a yes. better roadmap. I think that's right. I mean, and and I mean, just like your four quarters, however you want to think metaphorically of the quarter, as you say, in seasons yeah. or in movements in music or whatever it is. But I do think that it's helpful for people to know that there is sort of a roadmap, right? And I always say to people, when I go out talking about this book, that the sort of timelines are quite arbitrary, right? It isn't 50 to 75 at all, because someone stands up, some man stands up and he wants to ask a question. He looks vital. He looks sturdy. He looks strong. And he says, I'm 87. (laughs) (laughs) And you haven't said anything about me. And it turns out that he's right in there too with the rest of us, right? Still. So I think that even though there is a roadmap, one of the things that's always bothered me about the sort of prescriptive aspects of developmental theory is that it doesn't leave enough room for human variation and individuality and upside down stuff that you're surprised that it's there. But I do think it's comforting and reassuring for people to know this is a normal path. And even for people to know it can happen and they can fight for it against the cultural currents, against the institutional impediments, against the gender requirements. They can fight for it. I know I can do this. I can do this. And others show me I can do it. I mean, when you say role models, that helps. When you see over there, Aviva's doing it, right? She's doing it. And my 97 year old mom told me as I was returning to school a couple of weeks ago, she said, You're too old to go to school. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I said, Look See, who's talking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Do you mm-hmm. think there are people or personality types who navigate these kinds of changes better? Is there a profile that might help people be more or less prepared for later life? I think that. Some of us don't take ourselves so seriously. (laughs) And I'm one of them. And I think that's helpful to just be able to laugh at yourself, to not be fearful about making yourself vulnerable or foolish or silly, looking, you know, like that. A kind of a lightness, I think. Is that a self esteem issue? And I think that just a. It's interesting because I think that people who do have a strong self-esteem are typically don't take themselves too seriously. I think that people who are sort of so driven, so achievement oriented, I think that people who get all of their authority and power from the role they play, 
the position they hold, the institutional authority kind of question, those people have a very, very hard time. I also think, and now I'm thinking about my brother, who is a constitutional lawyer. He's an academic, legal academic. My siblings are my very best friends, and he's 17 months older, and my sister is 17 months younger. And he's had a career, although he's spent decades teaching at Stanford Law School, he's had a career doing lots of different things. Yeah. Somehow that doing of lots of different things means that this shift at this point in his life is that he's doing it, I mean, with such grace. And it doesn't mean that he didn't achieve greatness and hasn't left a legacy and all that stuff. But I think if you're used to a kind of a movement through your life journey, even in and out of marriages or in and out of parenting, that somehow this movement isn't so laborious and doesn't feel so scary. Does that cough up another, I don't want to overbeat this theme, but does that cough up another gender difference? I I think so many, it is more typical for a lot of men to be in sort of linear, up or out kind of careers that end suddenly. I think they actually have some of the hardest challenges in this transformation. Right. Because women are kind of in and out and they have all these challenges. Yeah, typically kind of women of are in, in and out and they do a lot of things at the same time. <laughs> They're multitaskers, <laughs> you know. Their identity is not quite so yes. linked to roles and status. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So different capabilities. And you're obviously a believer. You've taught in the Harvard's ALI program. You know, Stanford has DCI. There are now a dozen of these schools developing later life programs. What do you think of these? Are these key to navigating this particular pivot and pressure? I think they're wonderful. I do for all kinds of reasons, but they read to the public as a kind of affirmation (laughs) of this period in life as being maybe even the most transformational period of anyone's life. You come to it with so many experiences and resources and social capital and all of that. You come to it and there's so many possibilities. And you also probably come to these programs with already a good sense of yourself and how you learn and what excites you. And you come ready to I think, build a new community of people. I think the community and the collectivity of this is the real deal. So you're not not alone. You're not alone. Sense of, oh my goodness, I've gone nuts. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And there are these critical friends that you develop, right, in this, who are willing to tell you what they think and willing to tell you how they think you think about things. And so I think it's a wonderful place for people to be able to. I mean, I think everyone in those programs has been extremely lucky to land there. And even if it doesn't produce the kind of growth that you imagined and fantasized about, it will surprise in one way or the other, Yeah, it seems to me, as I talk to people who have gone through those programs. It's certainly a chance to step out and look at your whole life with yes. fresh eyes, which is yes. not, a, not a bad thing to... No, and there's something so wonderful about being a student again at that age, and at least a learner again at that age. And one of the things that I always love to do, and did it all the way through my almost 50 years of teaching at Harvard, is go and watch other people teach, right? And as I got older, I became such a connoisseur of pedagogy Because it was just wonderful to see how this transaction worked in the classroom and how it's just a wonderful time. You you look back on your colleges and you think, boy, I didn't take full advantage of that. But when you were at, at the ALI program, you just, what is there to do but take full advantage of place, of setting, of colleagues, of teachers, and you have an incredibly different appreciation of these teachers. And everyone becomes, of course, a teacher and a learner. It's part of this appreciation, why I put in four quarters as opposed to a third chapter was, I think it's mortality, right? It becomes ever more meaningful when the end date gets closer. And I think that's what lends color and vividness to the experience, that difference between being a youngster at college and being an oldster at college. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Something to do with the time we have left. Mm-hmm, for sure. 
You're the life development, adult development expert. I'm really curious to hear. There are a f- number yeah. of thinkers on adult development. I still feel like this third chapter is new and changing. Are there particular development roles that are different from the first half of adulthood to the second half of adulthood? When you say developmental roles. You know, I mean, some people talk about, you know, that the 20s and 30s will be ego development and needing oh, to achieve well, achievement result and that the post 50 becomes generativity, more intrinsically focused. Is yeah. that something you buy? Do you- Yeah, I think, well, of course, Erickson did talk about this stage as generativity versus stagnation. And one of the things that he gave us that was so important are these moments of developmental crisis where we can either choose to move forward or stay in the same place. And it is a crisis, you know, and hang on and do the same thing in a rut forever. And I think the generativity part of that, that I certainly discovered in my conversations with people in my interviews was that people did want to, rather than climb the ladder of achievement, they wanted to give back or give forward. They wanted to serve. They wanted to teach. They wanted to mentor. And they wanted to harvest. So I think that they wanted to be in relation to community in a new way and be a part of a collective rather yeah. than the sort of individual climbing of the pyramid to the top yeah. and looking down on everyone else. For men, they wanted to be deeper in relationship. They talked about learning from their daughters and their wives that this was something that they needed to feel good about themselves and to know who they were, in fact, be in relationship. There were things that were, there were some gender differences in that for sure. But I think in general, it was this business about rather than climbing the ladder of achievement, they wanted to really make a difference in the world somehow. Rather than self-involved, you want to be selfless, not in terms of giving everything away, but in terms of being empathic and recognizing that what you have, other people need. And uh, you wanted to be generous in that way. So, and it's a very strong impulse. I mean, it, it really is. One of the things that I've been trying to figure out for myself is what I can do that's small and significant. That doesn't require international yeah. travel and is really a in some ways, one-on-one. I have met with resistance because people want me to transform and speak to multitudes. But I think that there's also something about whatever people do, they want to do it relationally, intimately even. And when they do that, they tend to say, I'm getting back as much as I'm giving. Yeah, much more. So it's a much more profound, deeper relationship. And it's reciprocal. And you're learning something about yourself in the process. The other thing I think that I found is that at this point, when people are trying to figure out what's next, they often find themselves going home, going back to the root of where they came from, what they valued, what they wished for, what they dreamed about, and hoping to find that in some kind of way. And geographically, too, do they go back? They go back home. It's sometimes literal, right? It's sometimes metaphoric. It's sometimes spiritual. It's sometimes just emotional through a therapist. People go back. They go back to Indiana and they mount the stairs of their parents' house. They knock on the door. I'm home. And they have a kind of conversation that they were never able to have before. And they come to connect with those kind of dreams they had as kids that never could be realized for one reason or the other, yep. but that they were prohibited from developing earlier on. Yeah, something that goes underground for a few decades and resurfaces and resurfaces very powerfully. Yeah. Right, right. I found that very true with people who want to do something artistic. That the creatives, uh, yeah, the, the, the creatives, frustrated creatives yeah, who've been locked up right. being lawyers and finance chiefs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They can now paint or they can now join a regional theater or something like that. I want to end with the end. Are you going to write a book about the fourth quarter? Are you thinking at all about or even have you heard or observed as you yourself move on to these years? Any interest in exploring this phase of life and what might we want to know about it and prepare for it? And will it be as tumultuous as moving into the 
third quarter or is it a more, a different vibe? I am sure it's both a continuation of, but I think sort of more subtle transformation and some new challenges. One, of course, is health, which is huge. It's just huge that you dream and dream and dream about that day. And then when you get to that day, you have a terrible stroke or you get cancer or whatever it is that prohibits you from fully engaging in whatever you had dreamed about and planned for. Another thing is that your friends are all dying and so you're feeling lonely. So community and connection, that's required. I think here too is where intergenerational connections are incredibly important because we are so segregated in these age chapters. We are so much, and I think as we get to the end of our lives, pushed aside in some ways at the edges of institutions, not going to work. I think that that means that there has to be some real great effort to stay in touch with people who are younger, to learn from them. Those are just some observations of my own transition, right? And watching other people. I decided not to study the fourth chapter, mainly because I just never do that. I write a book and I never go on to what yeah. would seem the obvious. Sequel, but, the sequel. <laughs> the sequel. But I have written two books since then that are very much, as I thought about your questions, very much related to next stages. So right after this book, I thought I was writing my last book, and it's called Exit, The Endings That Set Us Free. And it's about the ways in which most of Western culture doesn't pay very much attention to leave-taking, to saying goodbye, to exiting, whatever it is. But we pay great attention. We're preoccupied by entering and launching and beginnings and next steps. And so we leave without any ritual, without any set of routines, without celebration, without making good sense of it. And so the relationship to third chapter is that my belief is that as we move along, we have to sort of make meaning of what we are leaving in order to take the next step that's productive. And you show that you're leaving right now. You're leaving 50 years of a beloved home. Home. And you were just talking about coming home. So coming home and then leaving home. It's very. So that this book is really, in some ways, a sequel to third chapter because it is about, and it ends, the last chapter is grace and it ends in death, right? Talking about death. But if we are going to be set free, we need to pay attention to those exits. So there are ways in which what I've been working on is so much related to this, but there isn't a fourth chapter book in my future. (laughs) Or we'll just say that exit is an invitation to ritual and conversation around what uh, that might be. And what was the last book? What was your... The last book is, again, I thought, related to third chapter. It's called Growing Each Other Up When Our Children Become Our Teachers. Ah, Wonderful. And again, if you see the way my mind is always working, it's what have we not paid attention to? So developmentally, we've always thought about parents as being the socializers, the culturators, the teachers, the mentors. And we haven't looked at the developmental patterns of parenthood. And more importantly, we haven't looked at the ways in which our children really are the pedagogues often. They are teaching us not only about who they are, they're teaching us about who we are because they know it's very, very, very well. And they're teaching us about the culture as it is now. Right. And I'm not just talking about technology or language or idiom. Yep. I'm talking about they are closer to the cultural beat of what's going on now. I have a 38-year-old what's next? Yeah. and a 40-year-old, and I'm just listening to them yep. half the time. I'm a student of culture through them a lot of the time. Because there's great resistance. I mean, this whole OK Boomer movement, there feels like there's quite a resistance to listening and appreciating that it's now their reality. It's their reality. And we have a lot to learn, right? We have a lot to learn. And so in some ways, my talking about needing to have intergenerational conversations in the third chapter as a way of giving forward, not anachronistically, but relevantly, right? that into a world that we don't understand as well as those people who are younger than we are. 
if we're going to give forward in the third chapter, we do have to be doing it with other people, with our children and with our grandchildren. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, I think we have a lot to learn will be the quote I keep <laughs> for closure on all of this is always yes. keep listening and learning. Yes, yes. Thank you I so think much so. for sharing all of your 50 years of wisdom on these topics and thoughtfulness with us. It's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed it too. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Take Talk care. Soon. Bye-bye. Okay, good. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining this conversation about Four Quarter Lives, where we're designing lives that don't just get longer, but better. For more, you can follow my columns at Forbes or read my own account of a year back at school at Harvard in my newsletter on Substack called Elderberries. <laughs>